Thanks for listening to our online messages from Calvary Chapel, North Shore, on the island of Kauai. Stay up to date on content and our events on our website, calvarychapelnorthshore.com, and on Instagram, at CCNS Kauai. If you'd like to donate to our ministry, you can do so on our website. Now let's dive into the Word. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11, are you there? Say amen. Okay, sweet. Uh, we're, we're, you know, this, this is so uh, packed with so much stuff, this chapter, that we're probably just going to have to park it here for a few weeks. So today we're only going to get through seven verses. So let's begin at verse one. It says, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated, speaks about being raptured, that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Father, thank you that faith in you is all we need to be saved, that your gift is free. And Lord, sometimes we take that for granted. I pray today that you would give us more faith, Lord God, because we know without faith it's impossible to please you. And so, Lord, help us to walk by faith. Keep our eyes on heaven and not here on this place. Speak to us today, we ask, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I believe the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews. And I believe as he's writing to this group of believers and those that were on the fence, he's encouraged them to keep going. Don't quit. And I think we need that encouragement too, amen? Because sometimes you feel like you're, you're serving God, you're serving God, you're serving God, and you're not getting anywhere. Do you ever feel like that? You ever feel kind of stagnant? I can't tell you how many times I quit on a Sunday afternoon. I'm like, I don't know, I can't do this anymore, Lord. I don't think anybody's hearing anything. I don't, I, I give up, and, and then Monday morning I wake up, repent, and sign back up. But we get discouraged, and I think when we get discouraged, the enemy comes in and tries to convince us to quit. Quit ministry, quit your marriage, quit your family, quit. But where are you going to go? If you walk away from Jesus, where are you going to go? There's nowhere else. There's no other place where there's hope. The hope lies within Christ and what He did on the cross. And we need to keep that perspective. We, we not only need to have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. If, if, if you saw it, you wouldn't need faith. If it's right in front of you, you don't need faith. We have faith to believe in a God we haven't seen. But the beautiful thing is, is that we've seen the effect of God. We've seen the effect of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 3, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus told him that, he said, listen, you can't see the wind, but we see the effect of the wind. And it's the same with Jesus Christ. I mean, how do you explain to somebody that doesn't know God that you have Christ dwelling in you? Well, how do you know you have Christ dwelling in you? I just know. Well, how do you know? I just know that I know. How do you know that you know? I know that I know that I know that I know. How do you explain Christ in you to somebody who doesn't have Christ in them? 
You just got to say, listen, you got to give your heart to Jesus and then I won't have to explain it to you. Because the Holy Spirit will make it all clear. And our walk can be difficult at times. I think of what they face there out on the mission field and, and the stuff that they go through. And I'm like, Lord, who am I? I, I? I'm complaining about the dumbest things. We were talking about that this morning. Man, my coffee's cold, you know? I mean, it's like, really? People are dying on the front lines. People are dying getting the gospel out. There's, there's families perishing for the name of Jesus. There's good men, preachers being thrown in jail and put to death for the name of Jesus. But you know what? I, I, don't beat yourself up that you're not laying your life on the line. But I'll tell you what, God has put you here for such a time as this that we, through our prayers and our giving, can help these people that are on the front lines. Because that's our family. Those are our brothers and sisters. And for some reason, God's put them in a place where they have to put their life on the line. I don't think you and I will. I don't know. Maybe things are changing in the U.S. I think Christians are starting to become the enemy in the U.S. And maybe it won't be long before it'll be against the law for us to gather. That'll be the true test of our faith. Faith must have endurance. It's always required faith and endurance to walk with God in a fallen world. These Hebrew Christians were being pressured to go back to the old way, to go back to the Levitical priesthood, to turn away from Jesus and, and go back to the law, under the law of Moses, under a system which is, doesn't even work anymore. When they offered up animals for their sins, it was only for covering. Jesus Christ was for the forgiveness of sins. He was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. It only covered sin. And Jesus is saying to them through His Word, He said, why would you go back to something that not only doesn't forgive your sin, but doesn't even cover it anymore? And why do we go back? the old ways because we get pressured by people right you get pressure come on man take a hit come on man let's go party come on man we live in a fallen world and i think through these portions of scriptures what we're going to see is god showing us that if you think you got it hard let's look at some of the people from the old testament and what they went through and how they gave their lives for their faith. How they, they laid it all on the line for the Lord. Because sometimes we can think we, we're getting, it's, it's really tough. Our walk's really tough. We're, we're really under attack. I don't think we understand what real attack is because we let the little things get to us. Maybe I'm just talking to myself right now. I mean, I, I let little stuff get to me. You, I could have 300 blessings from you guys and then get one email, somebody negative going off on me, and that's all I think about. So email Pastor Chauncey at Chauncey at gmail.com. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you that God's people have going through hard, been going through hard things since the book of Genesis. And you know what else is beautiful about this portion of Scripture? Is, is that when you read all through chapter 11, I mean, you read about these guys that messed up big time. You know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Samson, David. And, and God never mentions it. Why? They're covered. Isn't that awesome? You, you go all through chapter 11 and God only talks about the good things. That, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say this, that now that you're in Christ Jesus and the blood of Jesus is across your doorpost, God just sees you as just His. But what about all my junk? Forgiven. What about my past sin? It's gone. He just sees that that cute little boy, that cute little girl, that, that's my boy, that's my girl. He just sees the blood of Jesus and that's, you're golden. You're the child of the Most High. You're part of the Holy Family. You're a royal priesthood. 
kings and priests He's made us. We're of a higher order, of the order of Melchizedek forever. A higher priesthood, which Jesus Christ is at the top. And there's none, none like Him. And God sees you as His. I'm saying this because, listen, don't let the enemy beat you up saying you're worthless. You're nothing. You're good for nothing. You loser. I can't believe you did it again. That's the enemy. The Holy Spirit does not condemn you. The Holy Spirit convicts you. There's two differences. Condemnation draws you away from Christ. Conviction draws you to Christ. You know what? Chapter 12, listen to this. Verse 1 says this in Hebrews. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. He's saying get rid of the baggage from the past. Stop dragging your baggage around. Stop dragging your past around. Knock it off. Oh, you don't know what I did. Shut up. <laughs> Move forward. Dust off your shoes. Get going. God forgave you. He cleansed you. He's going to stand you up and wind you up and send you on your way. And He's not going to bring up your sins, so stop bringing up the past. He says, let go of that stuff that so easily holds you back from serving God. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so he says there in verse 1 of chapter 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we keep pushing forward. Because why? We know the Scriptures. We believe the Scriptures. We know Jesus is coming. If you live each day like the Lord's coming today, if you really believe that, I do, I do, we're going to live different. We're going to make sure we take the time for our neighbor to share the love of God. We're going to make sure that we're doing God's will. I want to finish. I want to hear. I want to be present when you guys show up in the presence of God. And I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant to all of you. I want to see him just putting crowns on you. Just look at look what you did. I am so excited for that to happen. He says, for by it the elders obtained a good report. You guys have attained a good report with God because of your faith. Though you have not seen Jesus personally in the flesh, though you have not heard His voice audibly, you have seen the effects of the Holy Spirit in your life and the effects of the Holy Spirit in this church and your family. God wants to use you. It says there in verse 3 that through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. God made everything out of nothing. The Word is bara. If you can get past Genesis 1.1, the rest of the Bible is a cakewalk. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You accept that? Woo! You will accept everything that's left in that word. When I was a kid growing up, everybody believed in, I call it, evolution. That was a big thing. I don't think it's such a big thing anymore. But it was a big thing back then. And it was so stupid. I'm sorry. I just got to say it. In the beginning, God. You know, this whole Big Bang Theory, give me a break. In the beginning was nothing, then nothing blew up. <laughs> How does that work? Oh, well, these gases started to form and this happened. Whoa, 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 whoa. Where were the gases from? You said in the beginning, nothing. 
And how does nothing blow up? And not just that, but when have you ever witnessed anything blow up and make anything other than a mess? The idea that we went from the goo to the zoo to you is like stupid. It takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does in Jesus Christ. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is no steady evolving in evolution. It's it's all gaps. You go from goo in the pond to a crustacean, hard shell outside, soft inside, and then all of a sudden you became an invertebrate, soft outside, skeletal inside, and then that fish flipped out of the pond onto the rocks, flopped around, got scratched, and appendages came out and it crawled away. They said whales came from cows that used to graze by the ocean and one day just got sick of the land and swam off and blew up into big whales. you got to have more faith to believe in that than you do Jesus Christ. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now we're going to look at three different people today because we don't have a lot of time to go through everything and I want to take some time. But first we, we deal with Abel. Abel was Adam and Eve's son. Cain was their first son. Abel was the second son. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaks. What's going on here? I know you guys are familiar with the story, but I'm going to read you something from Genesis 4. Don't turn there, I'll just read it. Genesis 4, speaking of Cain and Abel, says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and the fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, and he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desires for you. So we've got a situation here. Adam and Eve fell in the garden, right? God told them what? He said, you can eat of any tree. He shows them the, everything. You can eat of any tree except that one. And they were probably like, Where, where's that one? Isn't that funny when someone says you can't have? That's the one you want? You cannot eat from the fruit of that tree. What was that fruit like? I mean, of course it had to be just awesome, like, I don't know, what? Chocolate-covered something? (laughs) Right? And I could just see Adam when he told Eve, Eve, we can eat from any tree except for that one. What one? Where's that one? And you guys know the story. They fell, and the light went out of them, and, and now they saw that they were naked. They were changed. Something had happened. They were, wa- they were clothed in light. They walked with God, and then they sinned. They saw their flesh for the first time. It not only changed human beings, it changed all of creation. It changed the ground. It changed the plants. It changed the trees. It changed the animals. Everything changed. And they were scared, and they covered themselves in fig leaves, and they hid in the bushes. And God came and said, Where? Adam, what have you done? And he took away the fig leaves and he clothed them with the skins of of animals. And he was showing right up front that by the shedding of innocent blood, our sins would be covered. And that the sacrificial system that was put in place with Moses was to cover sin. It wouldn't take it away, but it was to, to get us through a time until the finished work of the cross where Jesus would pay for our sins once and for all on the cross. And forgiveness could come. And so what happened is now God was asking for a blood sacrifice, the sacrifice of an innocent animal, and it was a lamb. Abel brought the lamb, but Cain did not. Cain brought vegetables. He was a farmer. He brought the the fruit of his labor. And God did not accept it. It said that 
Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice by faith. Well, what was wrong with Cain's? What's wrong with bringing vegetables? That's not what God asked for. How do I know? The Word of God. The Word of God tells us everything. How did Abel know to bring a lamb? Because God told him. God made it clear to his dad. And I say that because in Romans 10, 17, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. How do you have faith? How do you know what to do? Because God told us. Because the Scriptures told us. So Cain gets angry at Abel and kills him. How's that? Not in a bad environment. Not a gang member. Not a gang issue. Wasn't, you know, wasn't exposed to internet, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. The sinful nature of man, it's, it's in us. You've got to get a hold of it. You've got to turn that, that stuff over to the Lord or it'll eat you up. It ate Cain up. He, he rose up and he killed his brother. And, and then when God confronts him on, he says, listen, the, the ground is crying out with your brother's blood. And then you know what Cain starts doing? He starts pouting. Uh, now everybody's going to want to kill me and, and boy, my life's just over and this is just really terrible. What am I going to do? And God goes, you know what? I'm going to put a mark on you and if anybody messes with you, you they're going to be in trouble. So what, what do you think that mark was? I, I was thinking 666 maybe? I don't know. <laughs> but not one place in that little whining from Cain did you hear him say, forgive me for what I did. He wasn't sorry for what he did. He was sorry he got caught. So Abel died for his faith. Abel suffered persecution for obeying God. And the writer of Hebrews is saying to these Hebrew Christians, he's saying, listen, he goes, you guys are going through the same thing. Some, some of you have had friends that have been killed for their faith, for being a Christian. You guys have been ostracized from your family. Your family wants nothing to do. You've lost your jobs. You can't buy and sell in the market. You're under heavy persecution. This isn't something new is what the writer's trying to tell them. The writer is telling them that you're facing today what's been going on since Genesis 4. Don't think you're a special situation. And we need to understand that, you know, living for Jesus isn't easy. He never said it was going to be easy. Matter of fact, he said you were going to have tribulation in this world. But you are not of this world. You've got to keep your eyes on the prize. Jesus saves the best for last. I'll say that again. I should have got an amen there. Jesus saves the best for last. Amen. You know, the Satan gives you the best first. You know why you sin? Because it's fun. If it wasn't fun, you wouldn't do it, right? You're not going to be tempted to eat a, a bowl of dog poop, right? Because that, that's gross. But the enemy comes and he tempts you with stuff that you like and he gives you immediate gratification and you know what I'm talking about. We live in a world now that we got to have it now, right? I mean, you get on that internet and it's, it takes three seconds. You're like, what is going on? Everything is slow. Man, I'm waiting. Oh, I got the color wheel. Great. I mean, you, you, you pull around at Burger King and you order, you're expecting that bag hanging out of the window by the time you get to the front window. We want everything now. And Satan, he, he, he goes after that. He says, listen, I'll give you what you want now. You want that pretty girl? There's that pretty girl. She wants you. You want that handsome guy? Hey, here he is. He wants you. You want, you want, the, you, you want those drugs? You want this? You want that? The, the phrase, they sold their soul for rock and roll is real. How many people are selling their life to get a quick fix and Satan then hooks you, and then he destroys you. And then Jesus comes in and says just the opposite. You know what? This place ain't your home. It's going to be a mess pretty much the whole time you're here. Don't count on anything going your way. But man, I got something for you when you get up here. So my point that I'm trying to make is death, dying for Jesus, these guys that we see in India giving their life for Jesus, Death's not the worst thing that can happen to you. 
being separated from the true and living God is the worst thing that can happen to you. Jesus said to the disciples in Luke 12, He said, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that can kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear, fear him which after he hath killed hath the power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. For you and I, for someone to come along and threaten to kill us for our faith, they're just giving us a first class ticket to heaven. I mean, how can it be? Somebody puts a gun to your head and they said, denounce Jesus. No, I ain't going to do it. Boom. Okay. Well, that was uncomfortable for about a second. Are you guys afraid to die for Jesus? Okay, three people are. Are you guys afraid to die for Jesus? You know, it's a lot harder to live for Jesus. Dying for Jesus is, is easy. I mean, you know, you see in the tribulation they're, they're decapitating people. That's actually pretty quick. That's not so bad. They say, they say that your mind will still function 15 seconds after your head's cut off. I could just see Paul. They took his head off and he looks up and he winks. I don't think we're afraid to die. I think we're, it's, we're afraid of how we die. Quick is good. I don't know about you. I want to go to sleep and wake up in heaven. I just want to encourage you guys to live for the Lord. There's nothing better. There's nothing better. Your plan is no good. His plan is good. Live for the Lord. It, it, it warns us in Jude, verse 11, that the way of Cain is basically, it speaks of those that, that are like, have the heart like Cain. And Jude 11 describes the way of Cain as, I'm going to come to Jesus the way I want to. I'm going to come to God on my own terms. And how many people are doing that today in the church? Well, my Jesus lets me do this, and my Jesus lets me do that. Oh, yeah, where's that in the Bible? It's not there. The John the Baptist said to the disciples, he said, that Jesus must increase and I must decrease. Until you can die to yourself, pick up your cross and follow after him, you will never yield unto the Lord Jesus Christ like you should to be used like you can be used. God wants to do great things through your life. Are you willing to let him have the, the reins? He wants to use you to blow minds. And the more we surrender, the more we will be used by the Lord. He says there in, in the end of verse 4, he talks about um, that um, God testifying of Abel's gifts and by he being dead yet speaketh. What does that mean? That means Abel's testimony is still speaking to us today. That's what, that's what that means. That, you know, you can take away my church you can take away my pastor. You can take away my Bible. You can throw me in prison, but you can't take away my relationship with Jesus Christ. You can cut my head off, but that ain't going to change anything. And, and my life will still testify. My testimony will still scream out that Jesus Christ is Lord, even if you take my life. And so he's showing these people that, listen, you're saying your life's in danger. Abel was killed for his faith. And then he shows us another example there in verse 5. Look at verse 5. He says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Translated means he was raptured out. That he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for or before his translation he had the testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So now he gives us um, a testimony of what took place with Enoch. And Enoch was one of the sons born from Adam on down to Noah. 
and Enoch was a teacher of the word, but not at first. It says in Genesis 5.21 that Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And after he got, begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. God removed him. Two guys in the Bible that we know of that didn't see death, Enoch and Elijah, they, God took them. Enoch's name means teacher. He had a son, Methuselah. It wasn't until he had his son that he started to walk with God. That happened to many of us, right? It, it, so for some of us, it took having children to understand unconditional love. Because no matter you, how many kids you have, you love them all, and they all go in different directions. Some are doing really good, and you're all stoked. Some are doing really bad. Some are doing okay, and some are messing up. And, but you love them all the same, and they don't understand. My kids used to always say, who's your favorite? Who's your favorite? We love them the same. We, we, it, it, if you have one kid that's doing great, praise the Lord. If you have one that's not doing great, that one needs to know that you love them no matter what. And you know, no matter what they do, how horrific it could be if they end up in prison or whatever, you still love them. You never stopped loving them. And God loves you, according to John 17, with the same love that He has for the Son, Jesus Christ. Is that mind-blowing or what? God loves me. The Father loves me like He loves Jesus. What are we worried about? He's got this. Enoch was called a teacher by name and according to Jewish writings, he was a teacher proclaiming the message that the judgment was coming, speaking of the flood. So he names his son Methuselah. His death shall bring. Imagine naming your kid that. Pastor David, what's your new son's name? His death shall bring. Oh, got a message for us or something? And it was taught that the year Methuselah died, the flood would come. Methuselah is the oldest living man in the history of mankind. He lived to be 969 years old. Back in those days, men lived to be 7, 800, 900 years. Crazy. Can you imagine living in that household with Methuselah? Every time he caught a cold, you freaked out. Every time he was up in a tree, you're like, get that kid down. If he goes down and dies, the flood comes. Right? I thought about it when he was like, help, you know, because he was around when Noah was building the ark, right? Can you imagine that? He was probably helping Noah. Noah would probably come on the scene and here, here's, here's Methuselah like five stories up working on a scaffold. And Noah's like, what's he doing up there? He's over 900 years old. Get him off of that thing. We can't have him fall and die before we get this thing done. And the message was going out. Hebrews here is telling us that Enoch's testimony was that he pleased God. How did he please God? It says he walked with God. How do you please God? Walk with Him. Just obey Him. It's that simple. You want to please God? Walk with Him. You know, the Bible says, draw nigh unto God and He'll draw near to you. Who makes the first move? You do. You know, when you say, oh, Lord, you seem like you're so far away, God's going to say, I never went anywhere. I didn't walk away from you. You walked away from me. Stay close. Walk with God. If you walk with God, you will please God. Listen, Enoch walked with God for 300 years. These guys were ready to cave in walking with God after two to three years in the midst of opposition. Enoch walked with God for 300 years in the midst of opposition. Remember, 
the fallen angels came down and took the daughters of men as wives, and all these weird creatures were being, you know, half angelic, half human, half angelic, and it was making crazy stuff. And the whole place started getting tainted. By the time Noah came along, there was only eight people that the bloodline hadn't been affected. Only eight people righteous in the world. Crazy to think about that. Enoch was taken out, and now all eyes are on Methuselah. In verse 6 he says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you are diligently seeking the Lord, God's going to bless you. He's going to reward you. Guys, I can tell you that from personal experience. You focus on increasing your walk with God, and God is going to do a great work in your life. He's going to pour out on you. When we don't have faith, we're filled with doubt. Do you ever doubt? When we start doubting, we start losing our faith. We start doubting, does God really love me? Does, does, is God angry at, with me? Is, is God mad at me? Has God turned his back on me? I don't think God loves me anymore. We've all said those things, right? Right? And when we do that, we, we've lost grips with who God really is and who we are in Christ Jesus. God loves you you God wants to bless you he cannot bless our sins and when we doubt we start doubting God the Bible says that anything we do that is not in faith is sin and without faith it's impossible to please God I want to please God then believe him walk with him don't buy into this stuff the enemy wants to put out there that God's mad at you and he's angry at you and he just wants to squash you like a bug. He wants to hurt you. You know how many times we don't have the things that God wants for us because we don't ask? You have not because you ask not. The Bible tells us that. I imagine that we'll get to heaven and, and, and God will like, you know, like I'll get up there and he go, hey Steve, come here, I want to show you something. Take me to some big huge room with all these gifts everywhere. And, and I'm like, wow, what's with all the gifts? And he goes, these are all the things I wanted to give you down there, but you were doubting me. Oh. Oh. You have not because you ask not. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be open unto you. Anything that you ask in Jesus' name that Jesus would want for you, God's going to give it to you. Hello? The power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the, the ability to do a work for God. Then we'll look at our last character for the day. We'll look at Noah. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, things not seen as yet, moved with fear. That's like a reverence for what God told him. Moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he, is con he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. So, you know, even in the Old Testament, it was all about faith. There was things you had to do, but you had to do it by faith. So it's always been faith. Remember Abraham? His faith was imputed to him for righteousness before there was the law, before there was circumcision. It's always been faith. And he's given us these examples. Of, we've already seen someone who died for his faith. We, we, so, we see another person who was, God was pleased with them because they walked with God. And now we look here at, at Noah who was faithful to endure without seeing any fruit. Did you know he, he built that ark for 120 years? Everybody was dying off. Methuselah's son, Lamech, already died. By the time the, the, the ark was built, Methuselah was probably, like I said, hanging out with Noah, trying to help. 960 years old, nine more years to go. We're almost done. We've got to get this thing done, man. The flood's coming. Can you imagine what that was like? You got an ark that they had to build that was 180 yards long. That's almost two football fields. 180 yards long, 90 feet wide, 50 feet tall. Like a five-story building. This thing was huge. Can you imagine? 
I don't think you're grabbing it. No Home Depot, guys. No cranes, no forklifts, nothing like that. Just, you know, axe, saw, Noah. His three sons, Methuselah, which probably wasn't good for much at his age. And somehow they found a tree big enough to get a center beam going 180 yards. Crazy. Everything lived longer in those days. Men lived to be seven, eight, nine hundred years old. Uh, people often say, well, what about dinosaurs? Were there dinosaurs on the ark? Why not? God made them. Hello. Are there dinosaurs in the Bible? Yeah. Hello. Dragons, Leviathan. Job talks about what I think is a brontosaurus. It talks about this huge creature that drinks up lakes and has a, a, a tail the size of a cedar. Pillars for feet. That sounds like a brontosaurus. Listen, you know, did you know reptiles grow until they die? Not like you and me, right? I mean, we grow to what? what what's like the final growth? 19, 20? Is that like 18? Is that anybody? No? Nope, just throwing it out there? No takers? Anyone? Okay, we'll just say 18, right? The funny thing about man, though, have you ever heard this? They say that your nose and your ears keep growing. Right? So picture Noah at about 800 years old. I mean, I'm talking, we're talking satellite dishes. I mean, Gandalf, right? But reptiles will keep growing their entire life. So think of it like this. You've seen some of the reptiles around here. Picture those things growing to be 900 years old. You've got a dinosaur on your hand. Right? Crocodiles grows to be eight, nine hundred years old. You got a dinosaur on your hand. Right? Enoch's taught that the flood was coming. Methuselah, everybody was eyes on him. And now we're down to just Noah and his family and Methuselah. Enoch warned of a judgment to come. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, the Bible tells us. So Noah was preaching for 120 years and nobody got saved. They all thought he was a whack job. Why? He's building a giant boat in the middle of nowhere where there's no water. And he's telling people it's going to flood, it's going to rain. It had never rained. The Bible says that a moisture came up from under the ground and watered the plants every day. They hadn't seen rain. They didn't understand a flood. They hadn't seen mass bodies of water. They just had mass bodies of land. There was a canopy over the atmosphere. There was water under the earth, huge water tables. And when God flooded everything, He opened up the windows of heaven and the, and the wells and the flooding of the earth. And He just sandwiched them from both sides. But until this point, they'd never seen rain. I mean, you could have just said, hey, God told me it's going to kabibble. What's that? Oh, it's, you know, this stuff's going to come out of the air. It's going to drop really fast. They're like, rain? What's rain? Look at him. He's, he's building an ark. This guy's a nut. Think of all the jokes they had going about Noah. How many Noahs does it take to change the light bulb? Look at this guy. He's an idiot. Boy, he's going down. He's out of control. He's lost his mind. It says judgment's coming. He's been building this boat for over 100 years. He's an idiot. You know, they probably had Ark Day. You know, like you have Memorial Day or Veterans Day. They probably had Ark Day where everybody poured out once a year. And it's Ark Day. Let's go. And they backed up their chariots, dropped their tailgates, busted out the brewskis, got the barbecue going, pulled out the lounge chairs and made fun of Noah. I don't know. Until uh, the boat was finished and Noah and his family got in there and God sealed them in and then it kabibbled. Right? Can you imagine when they started feeling those drops? The drops start coming. God tells Noah and his family to get inside. They shut the thing. Methuselah's already passed away. And God shuts the door. 
And how many people you think were pounding on that door? Noah, we believe now. Let us in. Noah. You know what's going to happen to people here on this earth? Is that they're going to die without Jesus. And they're going, I'll listen now. I'll listen now. Send Lazarus to cool my tongue. I, I'm listening now. I'm listening now. Too late. As long as you have breath, you have hope. But if you reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you reject the gift of salvation for all eternity that He's offering you, you will not get into heaven. You'll be separated from the true and living God for eternity, and you will be in torment. And He did not send you there. You sent yourself. He said, listen, here's the gift. Take it. Live for eternity. It's yours. God doesn't send anybody to hell. We send ourselves. Noah did the work for God for 120 years, and he endured, he endured at a time when the whole world was against him. Satan was trying to stop the, the plan of God. He was trying to thwart the plan of God. Satan was trying to keep the Messiah from coming. Once God gave the plans in Genesis about the seed of the woman and Satan's seed, Satan's been trying to stop the Messiah from coming. And so he was trying to wipe out by intermingling the fallen angels with mankind. He corrupted the whole planet. He corrupted the bloodline. He only had eight more to go. And he couldn't do it. And God waited till there was only eight left. Can you imagine just you and your family out of the whole world, you guys were the only ones that believed in God. Can you imagine that? How t you, think, you think it's hard living here? with everybody's opinions? <laughs> Can you imagine if the whole world was against you and your faith? That would be pretty tough. That's how it was for Noah. But he was a preacher of righteousness. He preached for 120 years. He endured the whole world while they were against him. And nobody got saved. And he was faithful. So the writer's telling these guys, you can endure, you can walk with God, you can serve God, you can obey God, you can even please God, even if others won't. You can do it. God says, I will give you the power to do it. Noah was faithful. Noah obeyed God, not only for his sake, but for the sake of his family. Look what it says there. He moved with fear, in verse 7, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. It's so important for you to make sure your kids know about Jesus. And still there's no guarantee. The Bible says, train up the child in the ways of the Lord, for when they're older they won't depart. You might get a prodigal, but they'll come back. There's a foundation there. It's so important. It's so important. If you love your kids at all, you'll tell them about Jesus. If you love your kids at all, you'll make sure they're in church. You make sure you read the Bible with them, that you pray with them, that you lead by examples. My children growing up, I was the greatest father. I'm not the greatest pastor. I'm not the greatest husband. But my kids all through growing up, they knew they could find me in my office every morning with my Bible. Even on my day off. Papa, why are you doing this on your day off? I like it. I'm not trying to toot my horn. I'm just saying. No matter what direction my kids went as they grew up, they knew what I was doing every morning. And kids are watching you. They're mimicking you. They're, they're like you. You know, I think of Lot. Terrible example as a father, but the Bible calls him righteous Lot. Crazy to think about. He, he goes to Sodom, and, and God can't judge Sodom until he gets the righteous out. And I thought that was pretty interesting because God is always removing and securing the righteous before he brings the judgment. So what did he, what did he do for, for Lot? Well, he couldn't bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah until righteous Lot was out. 
God told Abraham, I'm going I'm to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham was freaked out because he knew Lot was there. And he goes, well, wonder if there's 50 righteous. Would you still do it? And God said, no, I wouldn't do it for 50 righteous. He said, well, would you judge Sodom and Gomorrah if there was 45 righteous? And he goes, no, I wouldn't do it for 45. So then he's like, how about 30? What, what about 30, 40? What about 35? What about, you know, 20? How about, he kept going down and working God. And finally he got to a place where he just stopped asking. Because he knew that he was getting down to the number of, of Lot and his, his wife and his kids. But the angels came and they had a chance to get out, but only Lot basically was the righteous one. Nobody else believed. Why? Because they lived in a place that was so out of control and Lot didn't guide them in the directions that they should be. And so when he said the Lord's going to judge this place, they all laughed at him. His daughters and his sons-in-laws didn't believe him. His wife turned back and she was a goner. He only got out with his two daughters and they weren't what you thought they were. That's sad. So God couldn't judge Sodom until he got Lot out. I guess the good news is, is that God couldn't judge the world with a flood until Enoch was out, until Noah and his family were sealed. That gives me comfort because we see, we see a judgment of the flood. We see the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. We know that the world's going to have a great tribulation, the seven-year tribulation where God's going to pour out His wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. But we see with the flood that Enoch is a type of the church. He's not a Jew. He's a type of the church being removed through the judgment. We see Noah as a type of the 144,000 that are going to get sealed through the tribulation. Lot was called righteous, but they couldn't judge Sodom and Gomorrah as long as one righteous person was there. Jesus is going to descend from the heavens with a shout, the voice of an archangel, the sound of the trump, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and that we are the alive and remain will be caught up in the clouds with him. So shall we ever be with him. Comfort one another with those words. Jesus is coming to pull his church out of here. He's going to get all the righteous out of here, and this is going to leave unrighteous, and he's going to pour out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. So he says, by faith, Noah, being warned of God, things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. And thus lies the gospel. By faith. You look at the ten generations of Noah. It lists them in uh, chapter 5. Yeah, I think so. You got Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. That's their names in Hebrew. You take all ten of those names and you translate them to English. This is what it says. Man appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest. The gospel in Genesis. Hello. So let me close with this. Like Abel, we should obey God even if it costs our lives. Like Enoch, we should walk with God even in difficult times because that pleases God. And like Noah, we should work for and serve God and preach the gospel even if the whole world turns against us. Endure to the end. Because why? God's worth it. Amen? Let's stand.